Thanks very much. Hi everyone, I hope that you're all well. Um, thanks for joining us today. So yeah, my name is Eleanor Schofield and I'm the Head of Conservation and Collections Care at the Mayor Rose Trust. Broadly speaking, my job is everything to do with looking after the collection. So this can be physically stabilizing the objects, also looking after the environment in which all those objects are. So this is the, the temperature, the humidity. So all of the maintenance falls under my department because there's a lot of kit to create that. Um, everything to do with the collection, so all the information that we have, all the original records from the excavation, and all the records that we make now to do with treatments and condition reports, photographs, things like that. The other side of my job is partnering, or sometimes it's internal, but a lot of the time partnering with other institutes to set up research projects. And all of this is to understand the materials, develop new treatments, develop new methods of looking at the materials. Um, this works very well with me. My background is actually in material science, so um, all about understanding what materials are made of and how that will um, impact how they react in different scenarios. So, so that's kind of the, the, the overall um, remit of my job, and it's that part, the part of the science, material science, that I was going to talk to you about today. I'm not going to go too much into the history of the Melrose. I think most people here will know it. So this is a, a ship of Henry VIII which first set sail in 1511 and then sank in 1545. The ship itself was excavated in 1982 and in the years before and after that we raised over 19,000 objects. There are a huge range of materials, both organic and inorganic. Also they vary in terms of their size and how much they've degraded, so there's, there's lots of work there for a material scientist to do. I'm going to hopefully today get through three different materials, so wood, iron and brick. And um, starting with the wood, this is a cross section of Mary Rose Oak. This is very typical of what it will look like. The inside, it, the, the wood is in very good condition. And actually, in generally speaking, the wood is in really good condition for everything that it's kind of been through, how old it is, being in the marine environment that long. And the cross section is very typical that you will see um, when you look at the light microscope and the scanning electron microscope, that image that I've put there, that the cells are very full. And this is really how you'd expect fresh oaks to look. When you move to the exterior, however, it's much darker, and you can then see why that is in the light micrograph and the scanning electron micrograph. And that's because some of the material is degraded, it's simply not there. And in its place is the water. Now, when we excavate it, if we just let that water come out, you would leave a void there. So there would be a loss of structural stability to the material, and it can cause it to shrink and crack. And obviously, we don't want this to happen. In terms of then conserving the artifacts, it's very typical with the wood to do a consolidation treatment. We have always used polyethylene glycol or PEG as we call it. Uh, there are other options available, but this is probably the most common. Here I'm showing some barrel stays. So you see them in a tank and they will be put into this tank of PEG, uh, sorry, a tank of water to start with, and then PEG, PEG will be gradually introduced to it. And then on the right is one of our big freeze dryers. This is the preferable way to um, dry the wood. It's quicker and so you get less changes in the dimensions. You get favorable results, basically. Now, obviously, when it came to the ship, this wasn't quite feasible. So a tank treatment, actually, there are places which have done this. So um, the Berman Cog, they did do a tank treatment and they had windows in to look at it. But it was quite tricky, quite difficult. The solution, whilst it starts very clear with the peg in it, um, very rapidly becomes quite murky. So what I'm showing here is the spray system that was constructed around the Mayro. So on the left is when we were spraying with PEG 200, which is a lower grade PEG, a smaller molecule. This was a liquid at room temperature, so it's a kind of easier situation to deal with. We then moved to PEG 2000. Now what this does is it's a, it's a higher grade polymer, and so it really seals that degraded surface. Now this actually is a solid at room temperature, it needed to be heated, so we needed to take out the entire spray system and install a new one to be able to cope with that hot liquid. And the photo on the right is showing the, literally the day before we turn the sprays off. Uh, you can't see very much, but that's kind of the point. These are the conditions that we were working in. Um, it was around 30 degrees, about 98, 99% humidity in there. Uh, pretty hard going to work in there, very slippy surface, uh, and we would wear an oxygen hood, which would immediately steam up as soon as you went in there. So yeah, this shows the, the kind of environment of what it was like before we turned the sprays off. In terms of then going to drying, so I started working at the Marriott in 2012. It was a year before we turned the sprays off, so a big part of my job was preparing the ship for drying. 
not only in terms of understanding the wood, but also facilitating all of the work that had to be done from a construction point of view and also to facilitate the drying of the ship. So we used, we, we have two, um, two cranes alongside the ship. That's one thing that I didn't think I would ever have is my crane driving license. Um, and we would use this to, to access the ship and install this framework where we would then be able to hang these drying through tubes, which would deliver the air to the ship. What we wanted to do by this was ensure that each part of the ship had the same temperature, humidity and velocity. Because when you do that, you will uh, reduce the fact of one, the possibility of one part drying faster than the other. So you can see in the bottom left hand image, this is when the, the tubes were open and the, the windows that we had into the ship for that you can see. And then that bottom right hand image is of the three air handling units, which are tucked down in the dock bottom. And they are what deliver the air into the ship hole for the drying and now for the, to create the stable environment in there. So that kind of gives you an idea when I talk about there being lots of maintenance, it's, it's on huge bits of kit like this. Now then on to the research, we knew that there would be some movement of the hull um, and we had completed a laser scan, which actually was primarily done to work out the airflow around the ship. So we did um, computational fluid dynamics to look at the airflow to make sure that you were getting the same temperature, humidity and velocity around the ship to ensure even air drying and to try to eliminate any distortions. So we had that laser scan and then I, kind of caught wind of other laser scans that would happen and then we had opportunity for some to be taken after we'd started drying and um, this actually did take years of my life trying to get some of this data we didn't have some of it at the mayor Rose. it was one of those things where it was taken years ago it was by a company and then i contact that company and they'd be bought by another company and then miraculously after a few years i would managed to get all the data together and, and very kindly been helped by people at bae systems on the dockyard to assimilate all this data together this is just to give you an idea of the kind of information you can get and the kind of differences you can see between the scans and some of the movement. And that's quite a large movement you can see there, but what I would say is that that's a timber that actually doesn't have much um, supporting it to the cradle. So it is one of the points where you would expect the most movement. Now, this is kind of just looking at it straight. What we're doing now is drilling down into that data. There's so much information you can get from that. And it's actually the basis of a PhD project at Imperial College London, a student there who started last September. Um, thankfully for him, a lot of his PhD is looking at data, so the current situation is not impacting him so much. Um, but just to show you here the different ways that you can look at the data, we've got the different points in time. I've then correlated that to the different points in conservation. So you can look at cross sections through the hull. You can also then drill down in specific points. So this is then looking straight onto a deck beam. You can see when we were spraying with PEG that the deck beam is straight and it is square. And then sadly, as we've started drying, it has twisted a bit. And also there's a distortion at the top. Now that's actually because a crack has formed on the top of the timber. So you can see the huge amount of detail we can start to get from this information. Um, and like I say, this, the student is just starting on that. And all of this hopefully will feed into us designing um, and implementing a, a, a support structure in the future. At the moment we have the cradle and supports that were put in when it was first put upright after excavation and also some the more supports we've put in since drying so it is all secure it's just it would benefit in the future of something um kind of uniform and also bearing in mind that it looks aesthetically pleasing as this is a showcase after all so that's the kind of physical side of things onto the chemical side of things um a lot of our collection is the problems that we have is because of everything that's in it that shouldn't be there, which is essentially from the hundreds of years marinating in the seawater, and of course, from artifacts corroding into the materials. Particularly with the wood, you get iron and sulfur in them. And this is when they're exposed to oxygen, they can change quite rapidly and form damaging salts and acids. This is how they can look. We're looking here at a chest panel. And then on the right, we're looking at a where a bolt once was within a gun carriage. So the iron has completely corroded and this, these are the kind of salts that you get. So they don't look good, but they're also very damaging. So we knew when we were starting to dry the ship that we were exposing it to air to dry it, but this could cause some of these changes to happen. We set up a program of work with Diamond Light Source. This is a, a synchrotron facility which produces very bright x-rays to do very detailed material characterization where we would take core samples and take them up there and look at how the sulfur and iron was changing. We also did some experiments at the Mary Rose. So here, if you look at the top, this is one of the core samples. That's around a five millimeter diameter there. 
The first thing that I want to draw your attention to is where you see dark re regions. So there is a discoloration at the surface and also in the middle. When we did XRF analysis, so elemental analysis on this, we found that that correlated with where there was sulfur and iron, but also interestingly where there was zinc. We then did some STIR analysis. What's interesting with this is you can look at different components within the wood, and therefore you can look where it's more, there are, there are components within the wood that will degrade preferentially. So you end up with a, a different proportion of the different components because some of it's been lost. The way you see the higher number there is where it's more degraded. So you get this picture now where it's, it's visually darker, you have more sulfur iron and zinc, and that the wood is more degraded. We've done other experiments as well. This were, these were experiments done in Grenoble at the European Synchrotron. So again, X-ray analysis. What's really cool about this analysis is it's, a, it's essentially tomography, but at each voxel that it's taking data from, it takes a really detailed pattern of what's there. It's a little bit like X-ray diffraction, but slight, slightly different. Um, but if you think along those lines, it's giving you a characteristic fingerprint of what compound is there. Then if you know what compounds there, or, or indeed search and match to them, you can then isolate those out and map those relative to the structure. So on the left-hand side, we have everything that's there, and you can see the, the, um, the growth rings there. And then you can see where the peg is, so where the red is, there's is more of the material there. We also then interestingly saw this range of these tiny nanoparticles, which happen to completely correlate with our other data, showing both zinc, a zinc blend structure, which is zinc, iron, and sulfur. So all of these things kind of help us build up a picture of what's there, how it's changing, and where it is. Because obviously, if we try to develop a treatment, we need to know where it is within the wood to try and target it. This then leads on to some of the treatments we've tried to develop. I, some of the initial work I did at the University of Kent was working on neutralization treatments where you would add something into the wood and it would neutralize the acidic source that was there. This certainly is, is it works and there are definite situations where we'll use it and we continue to develop that at the Mayo. But the thing that always didn't sit comfortably with me was you are yet again adding something to the material, um, which I would prefer not to do. When I was at the University of Kent um, years ago, I worked with somebody who did a lot of work on magnetic nanoparticles. And I knew that you could get them to do all kinds of weird and wonderful things, namely that you can functionalize them. So essentially, you can add something onto the particle to do a particular job for you. Some of you will have heard of things like DTPA and EDTA. Um, they are chelating agents for iron. So what we did was attach something comparable to that. It's actually called porphyrin, but it does the same job as DTPA and we attach it onto the particle. And the idea with this work is, is that you would drive the particles into the wood, it would scavenge the iron that's there, and then draw it out again. We're just coming to the end of a four-year project of that, which has been really successful in proving the concept, so chemically showing that this, this happens and that you do pull some iron out. And now we're trying to find the means of how we go about thoroughly testing all of that, looking how effective it is, does it cause any damage to the wood, do you leave any of these particles in there? But as a kind of proof of concept, it's really exciting because as I said before, lots of our collection suffers because of things that are in it that shouldn't be there. And if we could find a way to take it out, that would be great. So lots more work to do there, but some, some promising results. So on to my next material, the iron cannonballs. Uh, we, in our museum, we have mixed display cases. This was really to enable us to be able to, to tell the story in the way we wanted to. And for most of the materials, this is fine, but it did cause some problem for our iron cannonballs as we chose a humidity which was safe, um, more favorable to the organics. Now, what we saw was that some of the cannonballs started to corrode and be damaged, and so we've taken a lot of them off display now. The problem with the cannonballs and with iron is it's the chlorine from the salt that gets in there. So once you have a right combination of factors in terms of the chlorine, the humidity, and the air, it can corrode kind of from the inside out. And you can see the image on the right, it just literally peels off and falls to pieces. As we have such a, we have over 1,200 cannonballs. Um, actually, still 900 of them are still in a passive solution and have been ever since excavation. But we have a good few hundred which have been through different conservation treatments. So we set up a project where we could try and look at those and correlate it back to how successful that conservation treatment had been. One of the things we were able to do, again, at Synchrotron Source, so using X-rays, was to do tomography. So this is on a, a kind of a chunk of the um, a cannonball that peeled off. So it could easily have been from that image I showed before. It's just 
peeled off there to the darker regions of the corrosion. And what we can do then is look what's there within it. So this is kind of showing you the outside of it. And then on the right, you'll see this one kick in now that you can look layer by layer all the way through. So you can start to look where the metal is, where the corrosion is, and where the cracks is. And then from that, you can basically map all of that. You can isolate it all. So you can look at everything that's there. You can look at sections. You can look at the metals, the cracks, the corrosion. You can look at the relative proportions and look where they are in relation to each other. So it gives us a, a whole lot of information. The other thing, actually, which I don't have any slides for, but just something to know, one of the experiments we've been running at Diamond Light Source is a, it's called a long duration experiment. And what's really cool about this is you're able to, your samples are just analyzed every week. So we have some different types of metal which are in a solution. Then every week, a robotic arm brings them out, they're analyzed, and then they're put down again, back into their solution. So we can actually look real time what is happening with the materials. And all of this, again, hopefully will help us or inform us of what to do with those 900 cannonballs we, we still have left, which haven't been through a kind of active conservation. And then my last material, uh, we re recently have started doing some research on our bricks. So we have thousands of bricks, um, a lot of them from the galley. And what you see is these salts start to form on the brick, particularly when they've been in a high humidity. What we did, this is about a year ago, we had a, a, an intern who was with us for a while. We did a, we took a selection of them and did some initial analysis on them. Now these are primarily, again, sulfur origin. So they're very similar to the problems that we have with the wood in terms of the, the chemical makeup of the compound. Um, we've only we've not done too much analysis yet. I just thought I would show you the, the start of some of it. Um, this is where I have to be careful in how I talk about it because I tend to see this and think that is such a beautiful image. Obviously it's not very good for the material though so I have to kind of treat it be, be careful how enthusiastic I get about it, but it is a very beautiful SEM image. And then you also get the, the compositional analysis with it. So you can see parts of that which are calcium sulfate, and you can see parts of that which are more iron and sulfur. Um, and then again, we've just um, a few months ago took some samples to, to Diamond Light Source. We tried to do some bench top X-ray diffraction, but the problem is you have so many different compounds in one place, you just don't get the resolution. And this is why something like a synchrotron is really beneficial because it's such brilliant X-rays that you get much greater signal and therefore you can kind of deconvolute very complicated samples which have lots of compounds and elements in, which as you know, we find all the time in archeological materials. So we've taken those samples there, we're working on that data now. And again, then we'll be able to use that once we've found out what's there and where it is, start to um, develop strategies to try and, and treat it and get rid of the problem. So the last thing just to briefly touch on, um, one of the things we've been working on a lot, and this actually was before the current situation we all find ourselves in, was how to do this in a financially sustainable way. Um, we have very, very tight controls in our showcases, which were put there for very good reasons, but um, it, it, it costs a lot of money to maintain it all and to pay the energy bills. So there's a, there's a responsibility in terms of the sustainability of the Mayor Rose, but also actually in the sustainability of you know, your, everybody's energy usage and, and how much you should be using. So we've been doing work looking at how, how our systems operate, how we can optimize them um, and things like that, and hoping that we'll be able to bring some of those costs down a bit. Um, so I just, there's lots and lots and lots of people, there's lots of different projects that I've kind of given you a little snapshot of there. So I hope that I have mentioned them all there. Um, and lastly, just to um, encourage you to support the Mary Rose. We hopefully will be opening later in the summer. I'm not sure when yet. Um, we post everything on Twitter. I've put my Twitter handle there as well. I try to post quite a bit about some of the research we're doing or some of the checks I'm doing in the museum at the moment. Um, so yeah, please do come along and visit us when we're open again. The other thing actually to note is the, the websites there. We have been launching a virtual um, website as well which with more information than we usually do. And that should be updated in the next couple of weeks as well with some more information and um, interviews and podcasts and things like that. Um, so the last job for me to do before questions is to introduce the talk for next week. It will be Peter Knott from the Nautical Archaeology Society, and she will be giving a talk on Sandwich Flats, the intertidal site that keeps you hungry for more. What a wonderful title for a lunchtime talk. So thank you very much for listening, and I would happily take any questions. <laughs>